All right, so with us, next speaker here is uh, Stefan Kinsella. He is the author of Against Intellectual <coughs> Property, which is a fantastic book I recommend you all read. He is a former adjunct scholar of the Mises Institute and also the founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. And without any further ado, uh, Mr. Kinsella. Hey, I'm totally – I'm glad to be here. Um, I assume we're slightly behind. And, oh, no, this is on time. Okay, I had my clock earlier, so good. We're on time. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad to be here. This is a, a great opportunity to speak this way. Um, without having to travel. Um, I'm Stefan Kinsella. I'm an attorney in Houston. I'm a longtime Austrian and Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist, have been associated with Mises for a long, the Mises Institute for a long time, and have written on a variety of basically legal theory topics, um, a lot of rights theory, contract theory, intellectual property, which is my specialty in law. I'm a patent attorney. Uh, but back in 19 – I think I want to say 95 or so, I wrote a long article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies on legislation. Um, that arose from my studies into the topic from a libertarian and economic point of view and as a lawyer studying the civil law in Louisiana, which is my home state, which is unlike the other 49 U.S. states that, which have a common law-based system. The, Louisiana has a Roman and European civil law type system. Um, so I've been long interested in the civil law and the common law and also libertarian theory. So some of these thoughts uh, grew out of my studies in that regard. Um, basically what I learned and what has been fascinating me for a long time is that um, the way law is perceived now is perverted. Okay, Most people, even, liter even libertarians, tend now to accept a more legal positivist understanding of, of law. Um, which is that law is basically something written down by some lawgiver. Now, the anarchists um, understand that can't be a legislature of a government, but it's a little bit confusing when they think of law as being written down in a law code um, because there's no lawgiver exactly. Um, but most people that are minarchists or just regular people that are not anarchists, they imagine law as what the government issues or decrees as the law. <clears throat> now, this is basically what has happened to the law, but that is not the classical understanding of law and not its origins. Any more than um, the government's domination of, say, roads and healthcare and education means that these things are essentially something the government can provide well or necessarily has to provide. Uh, you know, roads roads make sense without the government, and, but the government co opts it. Same thing with money and with healthcare and with other institutions, defense, police, things like that. Um, to go back to law, so you can think of the term law as a general term that we use in many contexts in, society, in, 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 in social theory and in thinking. So we say law, law is something that's regular, something that repeats, something that governs things. Um, one type of law would be, say, moral law. So we, we, we mean that when we talk about what's right and wrong, like what's immoral, what's immoral, or ethical rules. Um, we think of the laws of the natural sciences like the law of gravity, physical laws. That is the laws of cause and effect. Um, then you have um, economic law like the law of so supply and demand. These are all different types of laws distinct in their own domains. When we but most of the time the word law means what you can call juristic or legal law. That's the law enforced by some law enforcing mechanism in a society which is typically in today's world the state. Um, so law is the, are the set of binding interpersonal rules that are enforced by physical force in an institutional way. Um, that is generally in a given community or society. <clears throat> so they're enforced by the courts and they're 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 made by the legislature. This is how they're conceived of now. This is not the origin of law. So the origin of law is basically the response to the fact that we are human beings. We're individual human actors who live in a world of scarcity, and in this world of scarcity, what that means is we, um, we're we actors, as Mises calls us. So we envision a future that's coming, something about it dissatisfies us, and we have some understanding of the way the world is and what's available to us and what we can do to change it. So we act to change it. So this is what all human action is. Human action means uh, having some idea about the future that's coming without our intervention that we don't like some idea of how we can change things. So we choose an end or a goal, and to do that, we try to interfere with the course of events by causally manipulating 
scarce resources or means of action to achieve that. So that's what humans do. But when we act, we employ these scarce resources. That is, we control our bodies with our will, and we use our bodies to inter to grapple and to interface with other things in the world that you can think of as tools or scarce means of action to intervene. And they have to be causally efficacious. So you have to have under some understanding of cause and effect, what's possible to achieve an end, and what ends are possible to act. So all these things are the background of human action. <clears throat> but because the because of the nature of the world, that it's a world of scarcity, that is these scarce means of action, these resources that we want to use to achieve our ends are scarce or rivalrous in the economic sense, which means that there can be conflict over their use. Okay, So we need to use resources, which we sometimes uh, informally call property now, but we need to use or employ resources to get things done. And the problem is that these resources have the nature that only one person can employ them for that use at a time. So my use excludes your use and so on, um, which means that someone else can interfere with my use of this resource. Now, we like to live in society with each other because we have certain advantages. We like, we're like we a social species. We get enjoyment out of living with other people, and we're immensely richer for that because we get to learn from each other, and we get to trade with each other. So – People develop, develop specializations, so you have the specialization and division of labor, and you have trade, and we're all better off for that reason. And we get to live among other people, which is incoherent, uh, in, 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 consistent with our with our human, our social human nature. So those are the advantages of living in society with other people. But the disadvantages that you can be disturbed in your possession and use of these resources, these means, these tools by other people. Because of the nature of scarce resources. So the possibility of conflict exists because the universe is scarce, has scarce resources and because people have free will, and they can choose to try to take the things from us. So because most of us are civilized and we prefer to live in peace and harmony and cooperation with others, we prefer to live in a society where everyone can benefit. Uh, we want to benefit ourselves, but we want others to benefit too because most of us are not sociopaths and we have some degree of empathy for others. Uh, we tend to favor the creation of rules that assign exclusive rights to use these these things that otherwise could be conflicted over. And that is what property rights are. That is what all rights are, and that is what law is. Law basically always the use of force to to um, or other or other social um, controls to set uh, to identify the owner to to identify an owner of a resource and to help protect them uh, in their ability to use it, so to enforce their rights. So this is what law is, and the rules that developed in this way from early, from early negotiation, from primitive man, uh, and then from settlement of disputes, you know, when two people would have a dispute, if they wanted to avoid all-out all conflict and violence and war and fighting, they would go to a wise man, the, the so-called king or some arbitrator, to, dis, to, dis, to decide the case. This is not a state. This is not legislation. This is just an attempt at people to work together to find reasonable, fair rules among each other as to how resources can be used um, in a way that we can all go about our business and productively live in the world and then trade with each other. So this is how rights emerge, and they're going to have to emerge in the basic core way that libertarians believe, think of as rights. The rights to private property and to self-ownership, to own your body and to own other things in the world that you either are the first one to use, which we call homesteading or appropriation, original appropriation, something that had no owner but that you start using, or something like that that someone else owned but that you got it from by contract, like they sold it to you or they gave it to you. So those are the core rules of what the so-called private law is that developed in this way. Uh, so the private law is basically… Rules of property allocation and property determination, which are based upon self-ownership. Everyone owns themselves, and for an unowned resource in the world that was previously unowned, when there's a dispute over it, the person who had it first wins or unless he made a contract to give it to someone else, and which contract wins. So you have contract, contractual title transfer, original appropriation or homesteading, and, and body ownership. Those are the core principles of the law. Now, the way this developed in practice um, in, in the great legal systems of the world was first in the Roman law, which lasted for hundreds of years <clears throat> in the Roman Republic and then later the empire. Um, and the Roman law was developed in this way. Uh, 
it was developed in a decentralized way, which means that uh, it resulted uh, – the law developed as the result of the outcome of many, many thousands of disputes, uh, actual cases brought before people that could decide a case. And the goal of the law finder there was to do justice, to try to f come up with a fair result in this case based upon the core principles I mentioned and based upon the elaborations of those principles that were developed um, over past decades by previous – so by previous uh, uh, tribunals. So in this way, the law gradually develops and gets more sophisticated, and you have a body of law that develops. Now, on occasion, these these scattered rulings and, and principles need to be consolidated and streamlined so that people can understand them, so the judges can understand, so the merchants can understand, and so the average person can understand. And so there emerges a role for uh, codification, that is, someone to sit down and write a code which codifies this. Now, this can just be a private code written by a scholar saying, OK, I've summarized all the law here. Um, and this is what happened in history. Um, now, the second great system was the common law of, of England, which came later and which also lasted uh, for centuries and also developed in a decentralized fashion um, by courts deciding cases and, and, and using previous decisions, which we call precedent or stare decisis, um, and gradually building the law up that way. And because the common law came later, it often borrowed from and relied upon to some extent the, the, the old Roman law as well. So these are the two great private law systems of the world. They're not the only ones. There were more ancient ones. Uh, there were crude ones. There were, there were, there's also a Roman uh, – I'm sorry, a church uh, canon law. There was the law merchant among merchants in Italy in the, in the 14-1500s. Um, and there's also Jew, uh, Jewish law, and there's um, um, uh, the Sharia law, Islamic law. So you have different legal systems and structures, but the two great ones of the world have been the Western systems of the Roman law and the English common law. In today's world, this has largely been forgotten uh, by most people because we are used now to thinking of law as whatever's written down on paper by a legislature. In both systems, in both the in both the continental European countries and in other countries, and in in the in the common law countries and in the U.S. Um, and so, what happened was in in Europe um, um, after the Roman law was sort of rediscovered. It was rediscovered because it was lost for a time um, after the fall of Rome, but it was preserved because the Emperor Justinian had thought to preserve the bulk of the Roman law in terms of, of code, the, 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 just, uh, the, the digest of Justinian, uh, which preserved the law, and it was rediscovered. And so we now know what – we know roughly what the Roman law was, and that was rediscovered and used in Europe um, and de developed uh, in – it was added to with customs and things like this. And finally, in the late 1700s, 1800s, it, a, a modern codification effort was started by Napoleon and then others. Um, so you have the French Code Civil or the, code, the, the Civil Code of France and then others, the Italian, the German, the Swiss, the Greek, uh, other civil codes and Louisiana Civil Code in the U.S., which borrowed upon the Spanish and the, and the, and the French law. <clears throat> These were basically modern codifications of the combination of the law that had evolved and developed in Europe, the customary law. And also the some some church canon law plus the Roman law vestiges, and the, the legal the private the body of private law is beautiful and um, um, very very consistent with libertarian principles um, by and large. The one problem was that the this was a legislative codification effort. In other words, it was a committee of experts that codified the law, a bunch of scholars, and then the legislature took that. And enacted it as a law, as a statute. So that set in that set in motion the idea that of, of legislative supremacy or legislative positivism, the idea that law comes from the legislature. So even though the the substance of the law that the legislature enacted in this statute called the Civil Codes was based upon decentralized private law principles that had been developed previously, it was it established a principle that law comes from the legislature. Now, in the common law countries, um, the common law lasted longer, but over time, more and more statutes were enacted by parliament and then by the legislatures in, um, in the U.S. and the Congress and the federal system. 
And these statutes over time have invaded the province of the, co the core of the common, the common law, uh, various codification efforts like the Uniform Commercial Code and things like this. Now, uh, aside from the, from the codes, which are basically codifications of previous private law principles, um, which were enacted by the legislature and thus put in motion the principle of legislative supremacy or legal positivism, um, there, uh, there were also private codes like there was uh, – Lord Coke, and then there was Blackstone, which many people have heard of. And then in the U.S. today, there are the restatements of the law by the American Law Institute, which are basically systematic treatises which summarize what the common law is without being a legislative announcement. They're just authoritative guides. So this kind of codification is perfectly expectable and would, would exist without the state, but it wouldn't be legislation. So the problem is now that people are so used to this the law being whatever is written down in statutes. And the problem also is that most of the statutes that have been written lately in the last hundred or so, so years are not mere restatements and refinements of private law that was developed in a centralized way in the common law, Roman law, or in the, in the European continental law merchant or something like that. But they are just artificial, arbitrary statutory schemes that have nothing to do with natural law or with natural rights or private law. Uh, you know, like tax statutes, administrative law, uh, environmental regulations, things like this. So, and even the even the Constitution, like in America, we have a written Constitution, and everyone thinks of that as some kind of great natural law thing, but it's really just another form of legislation. It's just a committee of people wrote it, and then the the Congress enacted it as legislation. Now, it is fairly general, and it borrows a lot of concepts that did evolve. In a roughly decentralized way, in the in the in the English common law system, like the Magna Carta and the Forest Charter and things like this, but it also has just artificial provisions in there. You know, like the president has to be 35 years old and things like this. So these are simply decrees written by a committee, which has nothing to do with justice necessarily. So as James Carter wrote, um, he was a New York lawyer in the late 1800s, and there was an effort in the U.S to codify lots of the private common law of many of the American states as, um, as Louisiana had already done because it was a civil law state which had, the, which had a civil code. Um, so there was an effort in several states to take the common law, write it down into a code, and then have the legislature enact it. And that would basically move us away from the common law decentralized way of finding and making law that we have borrowed from the English common law. And this never really succeeded to any large extent in any of the major states. And one reason was there was an outcry by the common law. One of them was James Carter, who opposed this, and he wrote this amazing tract uh, fighting against it. And he has some some kind of great quote where he says that, um, you know, in, under the earlier private law, it was always a dispute where every party was represented by a lawyer, and the the goal of the of the of the of the court of the judge was to try to do justice. He would listen to the facts. Uh, he, he would listen to the evidence, try to determine the facts, and then consult previously established principles of justice and try to do the right thing. He didn't always get it right, but that was the goal. And over time, that's how the law developed and got, you know, got better and better because um, as, new dis as new techniques were found to solve a problem, then those rules were adopted more or less by other judges if they were successful, and then the, the bad ones were tended to be ignored or overridden, um, uh, overruled by other cases. So over, at least you can have an improvement of the law in that way. But when law is thought of as statutory law, then the concept of justice is lost. Um, and so the goal of the judge is not to do justice anymore. It's simply to read and interpret the words written down by a committee which we call a statute or legislation, and to apply it, even if the result is unjust. Like his job is to do that. This is what the Supreme Court in the U.S. does. They're interpreting the Constitution and federal law, which is statutory. Um, and this is what judges do when they have to interpret a, a statute instead of interpreting the common law. Their job now becomes not a judicial job of trying to do justice, but to try to interpret words and apply them, no matter what the results. Um, so this is the problem. Uh, with thinking of law as being uh, decreed by a sovereign instead of being natural and discovered by a decentralized fact-finding process. Um, so this is where we are now. Um, 
Now, there is international law, which is another type of law, which in a sense – there's been a lot of hostility towards natural law by libertarians in the last several decades, partly because they associate it with the United Nations, and there's a hostility towards the United Nations either by conspiracy-type thinking or by people that are leery of centralization. So they're, they're worried about a one-world government, which a concern which I share, although I think it's pretty clear that that is not a real danger anymore. Uh, if anything, the United States combined possibly with the European Union and um, NATO, that kind of thing. But basically the U.S. is the world hegemon, uh, and they're never going to give up seed power to the United Nations in any meaningful way. So the real danger is is the super states, uh, not, the, um, not the United Nations. The United Nations has no taxing power. Its, its mission is basically to be a forum for dispute resolution among the 200 or so nation states in the world. Even though it's, it's socialist leaning in its outlook because most of the states that are members of it are socialistic in their outlook, um, it has very little power, and its rulings are basically general and tentative. And the core aspect of international law is that nations should maintain their own borders, so it's sort of a roughly anti-war type ideology. <clears throat> and pacta sunt servanda, which means agreements are to, are to be respected, which is what treaties are based upon. Um, so in a sense, the core of the international law is less legislation dominated because there is no really real legislature. There's the um, – UN can issue resolutions, but it's hard to enforce them like regular statutes can be in state, in state uh, legal systems. Um, so it's, it's actually closer to the model we have as libertarians of a decentralized, justice-based uh, legal system, although its subjects are nation states, not individuals. So it's not perfect, but it's it's closer actually than today's modern legal systems. So that is where we are, and that's what I put in detail about. Now there are many problems that emerge and rise when we think of law as being um, uh, written by the government. Now, and and by the way, this 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 modern practice of of law, the shift in the impression of law from being imminent. Uh, natural rules of justice that that are fair or that attempt to be fair into whatever the government decrees um, roughly started with the the, the birth of of, of, um, of the uh, with the industrial revolution and then really it sped up after the fall of the monarchies after World War one so with the 20th century really so you have had a, a radical exponential increase in the amount of legislation basically what's happened is Hans Harman Hoppe called Democracy book, um, you have an increase in democratic lawmaking, which is what legislation is in exception. So there's no because of all of Hans and Hermann Hoppe's criticisms of democracy. There's no surprise that the quality of law has declined, and by quality we mean several things. Number one, it's not truly law anymore because it's just the decrees of some of some state. Um, there's no reason to believe. That these laws would tend to be correlative with what justice would be because the state is not trying to do justice. They're trying to basically redistribute wealth and, and transfer power around uh, to prohibit things they don't like, like you know the drug war or taxation or antitrust law, things like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of the feel we have now. That's where we are now in the world. Um, and let's see here what… What else I can add before I open the floor up to questions? Let me check my time here. Six – I guess I've gone for about 40 minutes now. Let me do this. Let me stop now and open the floor for any questions, and I'd be happy to take any, any further questions. And point – anyone who's interested in this topic, you can search this further. Just go to my site, stephanconsella.com slash LLW, and you'll see my legislation article and other things uh, related to this if you just search for legislation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have a few questions here for you. So the first one here comes from IEU Reed, and he asks, do you have an estimate for when law in a libertarian world is going to come out? Uh, this year. Uh, say I'd say within – but before PFS this year, which is a Property and Freedom Society in September. So before September, hopefully within six to eight months. Next question here comes from Gurry123. He asks, what do you think of the legal theory of David Friedman, parentheses, private law firms setting laws in small domains across territories? Um, there's a lot of value in David Friedman's work. Um, he is more of a – David has less of an adherence to 
um, sort of the natural law. I mean, I'm not a classical natural law thinker, but I I, I am sympathetic to natural law and the and the principles. Um, but I do think that you can have uh, reasoned arguments by libertarians that demonstrate what what our rights are, our basic abstract rights, and that is what the, that's what the standard of justice would be. It's not just whatever the market process happens to result in in a given community. So if, if a given community chooses to have intellectual property law, let's say, or chooses to have slavery, um, I would say that's unjust and unlibertarian. Uh, even if they do it, you can't just sit back and wait and see what they do. Uh, but give, that said, I do agree with him that there would be and necessarily would be wide diversity of the approach different legal systems would take in a private law society, in a libertarian anarchist. You would have different regions with different customs, different cutoff points, different legal defaults, uh, lots of variation. So what law can do is law can deduce or, or what, what libertarian legal theory can do is deduce only certain abstract or general legal principles. What Re uh, Randy Barnett talks about this in his Structure of Liberty, but the concrete implementation of those rules uh, can vary from, from, from society to society or from culture to culture a lot. All right. Next question we have here comes from Bay. He asks, as you know, the law, as described by Friedrich Bastiat, is a spontaneous order. However, in your opinion, what are the prerequisites for such a spontaneous order to appear? Oh, yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, so it's spontaneous. I mean, as as a Misesian Austrian, I don't really uh, uh, have much sympathy or use for that term spontaneous, which I think is more of a Hayekian thing. Um, I do believe in human action, and I think people people do things for reasons. And there are things that happen in society generally that are not the result of one person's choice, but the result of you know the negotiating of the market or impersonal forces and things like that. Um, but I do think that law, true law, can only develop organically. So you, some might, some might call that spontaneously, but I would call it organically, and by that I mean decentralized. So law develops from the desire of relatively civilized people coming together in, co in a community, in society, in, in a civilized, peaceful attempt to solve a problem, to solve the problem of conflict. So when you do that, you're constrained by the nature of things, which is the nature of the scarcity of the resources at an issue, right? And then how they can be how, – how these disputes can be solved in a way that is seen to be fair by people in society and by the, by the participants in the discourse itself, which kind of harks back to Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation ethic. Um, so I think the prerequisite would be you have to have enough people which are willing to be civilized, which means they prefer peace to conflict. Now, I think that the human race happens to be like that, and we're, we're like that for various um, – uh, natural reasons because of our social – because of our evolution, our social nature. Most people that are not sociopaths tend to have some degree of empathy for others. So they value themselves, they value others, and they have enough rationality and reason to understand that if you can avoid violent physical conflict and you can have peaceful trade and cooperation, then that is better for basically everyone involved. Most people understand that rationally. So I think you have – you need to have a certain degree of rationality of people to understand that. And and a, and, a, and a relative benevolence among people and a willingness to try to find uh, rule, property rules that allow them to get along with each other. Once you have that, I think you, you will start to have a proto-libertarian set of private law rules that will, that will emerge, and then over time they will be developed. Um, I won't say that private property has to be respected for this to happen. I would say in a way private property flows from this. Uh, once people do that, then private property rules are the result of that. But they go hand in hand. Next question here comes from Vito. He asks, "Why do you not consider yourself a natural law theorist?" Well, I, I, I'm I'm uh, very much in line with most of Hans Hermann Hoppe's social theory, and uh, the standard argument for rights would be kind of the 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 the, um, the deontological or natural law approach. Um, or the or the consequentialist or utilitarian approach, um, and there are problems with both. The problem with well, consequentialism I think is fine as far as it goes. It simply means if you prefer say peace and prosperity among humans, 
to violence and chaos and destruction and death, then if you have a modicum of understanding of markets, free market economics, and and just history and a little bit of social theory and political theory, you'll understand that you have to have roughly libertarian private law rules to achieve this. So that's consequentialism. That's fine as far as it goes. Um, utilitarianism as a subset of that is flawed methodologically because you can't sum up utilities. You can't compare them interpersonally. So you can't think of it in that kind of numerical way that some utilitarians do, the Chicago school. But consequentialism is fine as far as it goes because it just means that you know, we want a just system because it leads to better results for everyone. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you can't have a principled approach, which is what the natural law approach is. The problem with the natural law approach, as Hoppe points out, is that, number one, there are logical problems going from an is to an ought, which is what some natural law thinking arguably does. It tries to say, because our nature is this, therefore we should do this, or because our nature is this, therefore we should have these, um, these types of laws in force. But logically, as Hume pointed out, as Hoppe agrees, you can't go from an is to an ought. Um, and the second problem is that human nature is very, very wide and broad and, and diffuse. So it's hard to get specific prescriptions out of it. You know, like you could argue, like like Robert Robert Ann Wilson in his in one of his books, he he he, he uh, ridicules or, or criticizes natural law doctrine. Now, he equates it with the Roman Catholic Church and like their prescription on using a uh, condom. He says, like, it's just ridiculous. If you think natural law means look at him, come up with the rule, uh, pro, uh, contraceptives are, 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 are illegal or immoral, that's obviously absurd because you can't go from something so broad as human nature to something like that. Now, I think that's slightly an unfair criticism, but the point is you can only get so much out of broad human nature. So Hoppe instead roots his theory of rights in the nature – not the nature of human action, but a subset called the nature of communication or argumentation or discourse. When people come together as rational people in a, in a, in a, in a dispute resolution attempt, in an attempt to find a rule that can allow them to live together, in that context, they, they are people with scarce resources like their bodies and other things they need to survive, and they have a, a peaceful predisposition because that's what it means to have a, a rational discourse with someone. So they're already looking for peace. They're trying to find a rule that makes sense and that is practical and fair and that lets everyone live together in you know, peace, cooperation, and prosperity and harmony together. When you have those constraints, then you can start getting the libertarian core norms out of it. Now, Hans says that you could think of this approach as natural law rightly conceived, and I agree with that. So I would say I agree with natural law uh, if, it's, if it's Hoppe's version of it. Uh, but the general version is slightly problematic because of the is ought problem. Now, some some Arist neo Aristotelian libertarians like Roderick Long argue that you're not going from an is to an ought, which is analogous to the if then or hypothetical hypothetical construct. If if something then something, which would just be consequentialist or or not really. It wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be an absolute categorical imperative. It would just be hypothetical. He says you're not going from an if then. You're going from a since then. Like since you agree with peace and prosperity or whatever these values are, then you should favor the libertarian norms, which I think is roughly similar to what Hoppe does in his argumentation ethics. So if you think of the natural law as not being an if then, like going from is to ought, but, but being a since then, which is really going from an ought to an ought. Like since you believe in these lower level or base level norms or oughts or values, then – Higher level ones follow. So that's the reason for that. Next question here comes from Castor Troy. He asks, are there any areas in the United States that common law is flourishing? Well, I do think that – I mean most states uh, outside Louisiana have common law, and it, it, it's, it's – uh, there might be one or two where it's been codified, like Montana or something. I can't recall. But most states have, have a vibrant common law sector. It's just that they're – they're always under siege from the encroachment of statutory regimes. So every time a, a judge wants to decide a case, yeah, he can rely upon the way the common law in that state has handled it before. But he has to always be aware that it's possible the legislature has has ruled and changed it or passed a, 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 um, a comprehensive legislative scheme which governs that instead. Um, like in tort law, this has happened quite often, for example. So. I mean, the private law, like even the private law, area and um, uh, property law and criminal law, often there is the model penal code has been adopted as a statute. 
even though the principles in there were developed in a decentralized fashion, more and more often there's a statute the judges have to look at. Now, to their credit, in the common law in England and and the other Commonwealth countries, um, the judges of the common law, they, they're said to be jealous of their domain, which means um, they're not going to give up resorting to their common law unless you force them to with a very, very explicit, detailed statute, which is one reason that in the common law countries, statutes tend to be extremely detailed and redundant and long uh, and not elegant and abstract in general like the European statutes, at least the European civil codes tend to be. Because in the European system, the judges are used to being mere functionaries. They're not really as high and mighty and powerful. They don't really make the law like in the common law. The judges are used – their their job is more like a bureaucrat. They're, they're supposed to read the code and apply it to this case in front of them and just apply it. <clears throat> um, now, let me say one other thing here I mentioned meant, meant to mention earlier, uh, one comment I've had before. This is a US-centric point, and in the United States system, the United States federal government is one of the most unique governments in the history of the world for several reasons, not only its size and reach and power and 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 wealth um but also it's the most powerful government and yet it's the as far as i'm aware it's the only sovereign state on the earth which doesn't have general powers general legislative um or police power it's called plenary powers most states are said to have plenary or complete legislative power which which means the legislature like say australia or germany or um or, or Texas, these states can just issue a law based upon whatever topic that they want, or, or, or their law can cover – so their laws can cover murder, and their laws can cover theft. The United States, because we have this federal – the constitution, which grants them enumerated powers, doesn't have general legislative power. Now, the courts have twisted that to find it more or less in the, in the Commerce Clause and in other clauses. By by bending it, but still, it's theoretically, technically, a government of enumerated powers, which means the Congress in the U.S. US could not enact a law um, saying murder is illegal, not because such a law is unjust, but just because they don't have the power to do it. So they have some laws making murder illegal, but it's only like where there's a uh, the person crosses interst uh, interstate borders, so it's a it's a just a, or they kill a federal agent, like it's just a narrow case, but not in general. So that's one interesting thing. And so because of this system, um, in my view, in, in, in the United States, in the federal system, which is dominant, <coughs> excuse me, except in the private law, the private law is still roughly governed by the private laws of the states, like marriage law and, co and property law, tort law, things like that. Um, because of this, there is no such thing as federal common law in, 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 the, in the federal government. Federal law in the United States consists only of two things. It consists of the Constitution, which is arbitrary law written down by a committee of bureaucrats. It's a statute, and federal statutes, which are all arbitrary and written down. And they're not private law that was developed in a decentralized form in Rome or in the common law. They're just arbitrary decrees. And the job of federal judges, the Supreme Court included, is primarily to interpret the Constitution or federal statutes. So their job is almost never to do justice. There's a one, one rare exception, and that is when they hear a diversity case, and they hear a dispute between two private parties, between two states, that's on a private law matter. That court will apply under the Erie Doctrine. They will look to the state's private law and apply that law. So in that case, the judge is pretending to be a state judge, state court judge, and applying private law. So in that case, they're doing real, real, real judging. They're trying to find a fair result based upon… Uh, uh, organically developed private law principles. But for the most part, federal judges' job is simply to read the words written down on paper, which have nothing to do with justice. They're just what a committee <laughs> issued, and apply them. This is why we have people in jail for long sentences that make no sense and that are totally unfair, copyright infringement and all kinds of things. Um, so I made the comment, I don't know, a few weeks or months ago, or I've made it many times before, Federal judges are not really judges. You know, the Supreme Court judges, they're just guys in robes. They're employees of the federal government. And, and uh, Nick Sarwark, who used to be the head of the Libertarian Party here, uh, who I know, you know, told me, oh, that's a stupid comment, just saying you don't think someone's a judge because you don't agree with them. It's like, no, I'm not saying it's because I don't agree with them. It's because their job is not to be judges. Their job is not to do justice in a given case. 
Their job is just to interpret words and apply them, no matter what the result is. Um, so a state court judge, I wouldn't say the same thing. A state judge in, in, um, in Australia or Germany or, or Texas or New York, at least if it's a, a matter governed by the common law, they, are, they actually are trying to do justice in those cases because that is the, their, their mission, their remit. Uh, anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent, but go ahead. I'll take another question. All right. Next question here comes from Murray Rothbard. He asks, what is your view on the death penalty and retributive justice in general? Do you believe that a tort system might be a good replacement? Um, well, I wrote an article around the time of that legislation article I went through earlier um, on my theory of rights, which is complementary to – builds upon Hoppe's argumentation of mine is based upon a principle called estoppel. And I do think that – in general, there is a right to retribution. Uh, I know a lot of libertarians don't think that there is. I think they're wrong. I think um, I think they're confusing motivation and purpose of the victim with the nature of what he has the right to do. So basically, if someone commits an act of aggression, they're invading the borders of your resource, which could be your body, which would be you know assault and battery or rape or murder, something like that, kidnapping, um, or it could be the invasion of the borders of or the unconsented to use of, which is called uh, conversion sometimes, of a resource that you own. So in both cases, the aggressor is acting upon the, the rule he's laying down, which is someone can use other people's resources without their consent, or someone can use someone's resources even if they object to it. So he's laid down that law, so I believe you can argue, you can show that it's just for the victim or his agents if they, if they catch the criminal later. To do the same thing to him because he can't object to his property being used without his, over his objection because he's already laid down that law. He's already, in effect, pre-consented to it. Um, so what that means is that the victim has the right to inflict force or to use the resources of his aggressor even though the guy is objecting. Now, how he uses it is up to him. He can use it to punish, which we can call retribution. So that's just his motivation, but he has the right to do it. He can use it to bargain with the guy to get a payment, which you could call restitution. Uh, he could use it – he could forgive the guy if you wanted to, or he could use it to imprison the guy for a while hoping to rehabilitate the guy. So then his purpose would be rehabilitation, or he could use it to send a message to other people, in which case his purpose is deterrence. So the purpose is you might use your right to punish uh, or up to you, but you have the right to do it. Now, that is a theoretical thing. And I do think in, in primitive systems or in systems where you don't have time to do others, you, 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 you could have rough justice like that. If someone steals your horse west, and that could basically kill you because you need your horse to survive, you could see the capital punishment being inflicted for crimes like that, like have very, very harsh punishment and rough justice. But I think as the legal system develops, as we become more modern in society, um, I think that over time what would happen and what has happened and what would happen in a private law society is that retribution would be, would be used very, very rarely, incarceration, execution, and even punishment. And the reasons are manyfold. Randy Barnett goes into some of the structure of liberty. But one is that um, um, there's always a possibility of mistake, and if you punish someone – and it turns out that you punished an innocent person, now you've committed a crime, okay? And so who's going to take that risk? So you could see isolated acts of vigilante justice. You know, some guy's kid gets murdered, and he goes out, and uh, the guy gets caught, and he just kills the guy instead of taking restitution. And everyone just walk, blinks, turns their head and lets it pass. <clears throat> but it's hard to imagine an institutionalized setting. I mean, hiring you know, ABC Corp to put people in prison – uh, number one would be very expensive, and number two, they they would incur possible lots of liability if they incarcerated an innocent person. So because the standard of proof would be so high, it would be beyond a reasonable doubt to justify imprisoning someone. And because the cost is high, who's going to pay the cost? The victim? Uh, you know, uh, the uh, incarceration is expensive, and so would be execution and the proceedings surrounding it. So I believe what would happen in society is that you would tend to have a restitution-based system, but it would ultimately be based upon the right to punish. So right now, if someone commits a tort against someone, um, the jury is simply told if you decide the tort was committed, you have to decide what the damages are. So if someone is harmed, 
the jury just randomly arbitrarily makes up a number three hundred thousand dollars for you know loss of a loss of a finger or something like that. But if you told them instead, imagine that the defendant had the right to punish this guy proportionally and do onto him what he did to the victim, how much would this vict- how much would this aggressor be willing to pay to buy his way out of the punishment? And that kind of construct can uh, give a more narrow way to confine what the jury can imagine. It, w- it would tend to make the results more predictable and more more related to justice. And it would also solve the millionaire problem. It's just this idea that, well, if, if if a life is worth three million dollars, then Bill Gates can go murder as many people as he wants and just buy just pay the pay the fine. No, if you imagine that the victim's family has the right to catch and kill you in return, then a billionaire would be willing to pay, you know, nine tenths of his estate as a fine, right? To to get out of being killed. So the, the rich guy would pay more in terms of restitution. So that way of looking at it would handle this. I discuss a lot of this, by the way, in detail in my punishment and proportionality article from 1995 or six. Okay. Well, uh, in closing, you have to say thank you very much, Mr. Consola, for you being here with us tonight. We appreciate it very much answering all of our questions and everything. So uh, before we wrap up our time with you here, do you have anything to plug or anywhere where people can follow you at? No, just stay tuned for st- at Stephen Kinsella slash LLW for my upcoming book, which will be um, edited selection of my legal theory articles. And uh, I am uh, behind the uh, the new podcast feed for the Property and Freedom Society. We're releasing all of our old episodes uh, of speeches given at Property and Freedom Society meetings. That's at Property and Freedom Network, so you, you might want to subscribe to that podcast feed. And we will be caught up to 2021 by the time this coming meeting starts in September. and then we will start releasing uh, all the current speeches every year on that podcast feed. So just in case anyone's interested in that.